Hello and welcome. Everybody has that TGIF feeling, I hope. Thank you for joining us. Today we have a special guest, Shochu expert Stephen Lyman. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. It's great you could join and uh, you sent me some amazing Shochu samples that we're going to be talking about a bit later. I was thinking every 10 minutes I'd try a little sip of one so you can recommend. Sure. how I should drink it. <laughs> a All little right. Sounds good. intro about um, Stephen. He, the easiest way to find your work is on your Kampai US website and Instagram and Twitter. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Kampai.us. Kampai.us. Uh, yeah. US. And then uh, at Shochu underscore Danji, D-A-N-J-I, which means stubborn Kyushu man, basically. <laughs> so Which, I'm, stu I'm stubborn that, for shochu. Does that fit you? No. Uh, well, I'm not a Kyushu Danji, but I am a shochu Danji. I'm yeah. pretty, pretty okay. uh, stubborn about shochu. That makes yeah. sense. Um, so I've got your profile here. It says you're one of the leading American experts on authentic Japanese shochu, and you visited approximately 90 shochu distilleries and sampled around 3,000 different brands. Is that right? Uh oh, you're frozen. Okay. Could be, give or take a few. Okay, that's great. Um, anything else you want to mention about your background before we start in on introducing your book? Uh, well, I mean, I, I was the first certified shochu advisor uh, in America. I took the first course. Um, the first class was offered in English in Los Angeles in 2015. After that, I was actually named a shochu ambassador by Cool Japan program. And I have been consulting with various government agencies and how to get shochu more popular overseas, how to introduce it to foreigners and that sort of thing. And then I also, since 2013, actually, I've been working in an all handmade shochu distillery in Kagoshima Prefecture every fall, making uh, the Yamato Sakura blend, brand, which I did manage to grab the bottles. So all right, this is, great. Do you ever see this? This is what I help, uh, help make. So there's probably a little bit of my sweat in every bottle. Um, Hopefully not too much of my blood. <laughs> Any tears? Any tears? Uh, plenty of tears. Yeah. Plenty of tears. Yeah. <laughs> so you just work. recently published an, a really great book, which I have been going through and making notes on for the talk today, The Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks. Um, how long was that in the making for you? Uh, it took about 18 months from the time Chris Bunting and I signed the contract until we released the book. Um, we had had a very clear plan in mind. Yep. Copies of it. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it took about 18 months to complete. And really the intention was to try to be an intro introductory guide to the beverage traditions of Japan, but also acknowledging that there are a lot of Western alcohols that uh, are made in Japan and made very well, such as Japanese whiskey. And everybody knows, I think, you know, internationally you know, knows a lot of the Japanese beer brands. Uh, but really, the my my goal in writing the book, you know, my secret goal was to really get a wider audience for for shochu and awamori from Okinawa, because I just love these drinks and I I really feel like they should be better known. They're really uh, Chris Pellegrini likes to call it the uh, Japan's best kept secret, and it's it's really true that you know 99% of shochu is consumed in Japan, and that really needs to change. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting, and there's so many great insights. Um, there's about food culture as well as alcohol from different areas. And um, I was also watching your great YouTube, expo like a lecture that you did in New York two times, uh, talking about the book and the history of alcohol in Japan and everything. Really fascinating. Um, I was really Thank surprised. You about the number of sake breweries versus shochu distilleries. Do you want to give everybody some numbers? Because that kind of surprised me. That's right. It's, it's, it's a little bit hard to know exactly how many are, are active, but I believe currently there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 or 1,200 sake licenses, brewery licenses. And then there are around 400, 
45 shochu distilleries currently, and that includes 47 Okinawan Awamori distilleries. So they're about probably around 400 uh, shochu distilleries in Japan, which sounds like a lot, but there are tens of thousands of baiju distilleries in China. <laughs> wow. And then so, you were so. talking, these are little snippets that I picked out of the YouTube stuff. And hopefully we'll, we'll put the links below as well, because those two are great lectures that people should definitely go and watch. Um, I was surprised how many craft beer places, over 300 in Japan, right? Craft beer is That's right. coming up to almost on par with shochu distilleries, it sounds like. That's right. Craft beer has really seen a boom. Uh, it's it's still a niche product. About I think it's maybe two percent of the Japanese beer market is craft, uh, which is much different than in the U.S. But uh, it's growing, and they there's they're now developing their own styles, which is fascinating because, you know, each each country should have their local beer style based on what local ingredients they have avail available, and so Japan obviously is using a lot of rice in their beer, but also a lot of the citrus is what ends up getting used to make essentially Belgian style white ales with uh, with yuzu or with kabosu or you know one of the local citrus from around Japan. Maybe in a future episode we can talk about the craft beer industry because I have a few sure. favorites of my, which are very sustainable which um, we could definitely talk about but today is about shochu so we'll stick to topic. Right. Um, in, your, in your talk you were talking about what a wise toji told you about shochu, the three different aspects of Shochu. Do you want to explain that before That's we start? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He, he told me that uh, Shochu is three things. It's people, place, and ingredients. And those three things combined are required to make great Shochu. And it's it's really a philosophy that runs throughout the industry, you know, from, from the smallest to the largest makers. And, and the, you know, the even at the large makers, the corporate culture is really phenomenal in, in how they take care of their employees. They really feel like a family. And there's really a focus on uh, sustainability with the larger makers are using a lot of their, uh, their shochu lees, the leftover solids after production for biofuels and things like that. We're actually trying to get, get them made into something else. And, and then even smaller distilleries are often using those for animal feed. Uh, you know, getting it to local farmers to give, well, pigs love alcohol, actually. So the sake and the shochu leaves have a little leftover alcohol in them. So you send it off to the pigs and the pigs are happy and drunk. So <laughs> that's part of, part of why the, that Kagoshima black pork tastes so good, I think. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. And then the, the types of shochu, um, where, where is it made to, you talk about 90% of shochu is made in Kyushu. And that's, right. uh, that's, that's a rough estimate. And and there were four. But mostly, yes. Yeah. Southern, Southern Kyushu is where where most of the distilleries are concentrated. Uh, between uh, Kagoshima, Miyazaki, and Kumamoto Prefecture, have have the majority of shochu distilleries. Uh, fair number here in Fukuoka, which is where I'm based. Um, and th there are four WTO recognized World Trade Organization uh, geographic indications or GIs. Those are Satsuma shochu, which are sweet potato shochus from Kagoshima. Uh, Kuma shochu, which is rice shochu from Kumamoto, specifically around Hitoyoshi and the Ku Kumagun region. Then there is Iki shochu, which is uh, traditional barley shochu made on Iki Island in Nagasaki Prefecture. And then finally, you have Okinawan awamori, which is made with uh, long grain Thai rice, uh, almost exclusively down in uh, Okinawa. And then there's a fifth uh, GI, which is actually a Japanese government GI, and that's for, for uh, Amami Kokuto. So kokuto is made from kokuto sugar, a uh, very uh, healthy, unrefined sugar source, and uh, can only be uh, kokuto shochu can only be made in the Imami Islands. Otherwise, it's taxed uh, and sold as rum. So it's a it's a very interesting style as well. That's really interesting, and it's just about time I need to taste one of them. Um, All right. Now let's look at the filtered versus unfiltered picture here. Of course, all the ones that I have samples of are filtered. Um, is there a big taste difference, right. filtered, unfiltered? Of course, there must be. Uh, yes, there is. There, there's a lot of residual uh, fatty acids in in the shochu distillate because it's typically only distilled one time. And as a result, you have oils that continue to exist in the distillate 
And so that actually gives you a lot of flavor and a lot of mouthfeel, uh, which you wouldn't expect from a lot of distilled alcohols such as vodka or, or gin. But uh, what you end up with, if you filter it, you take away some of that. There's a little bit of le little bit less flavor. There's it's there's less mouthfeel, and it doesn't linger as long on the palate because the oils aren't there. Just like you use milk to get rid of the spice from hot peppers, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're replacing the the fats in the milk offset the fats in the, the oils in the peppers, and so that's because those those oils have coated your tongue. That's why your mouth stays hot, right? And it's the same thing with shochu that's really oily, that the flavors will last longer. That's so interesting. And you were you were talking about um, how it's stored and after two fermentations and then stored and if it's stored near the ocean you might have some briny taste or something. So this is, the first one is from Amami Oshima, the one okay. that you mentioned. Do you want to give us a story about this Yamada distillery? Yeah, so Yamada distillery uh, is a, a very small family-run distillery, probably the smallest on the main island of Amami. I actually have their Ichiban Bashi brand here, which is the one that you're trying. Okay, are you going to try it as well? I am not, actually. I think I'm going <laughs> to wait to until drive. after this to... Drive somewhere. <laughs> so there's a, a very mild, it's not like at all acidic or anything. It's a really beautiful fragrance. Mm. Yes, and I chose, I chose this brand because uh, Yamada-san actually grows his own kokuto. Mm -hmm. And he has a brand. Unfortunately, he only makes about 400 bottles a year, so I couldn't send you a sample of that because I don't have one. Of uh, He makes a brand that's made with locally harvested rice and locally harvested kokuto from the town where he makes his shochu. And this brand is called Ichiban Bashi or number one bridge because his originally dis original distillery location or his family's d distillery was uh, at the foot of the first uh, highway bridge built in Amami. So uh, when, when you say kokuto, kokuto is black kokuto. sugar, is that right? That's right, black yeah. sugar or brown sugar. It's basically an unrefined sugar that's really made throughout uh, Okinawa, Amami, and parts of Southeast Asia. And, but the, the, the finest brands of Amami Kokuto Shochu will be made with local sugar. That's really nice. I, I'm a fan. That's so yeah, far so good. Good, good. good. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm not, that's I'm not mixing favorite. them all. I'm just gonna have tiny, tiny little tastes of them. Um, sure. Okay, I love this part where you give recommendations about if you like this, then you'll like this kind of shochu. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so if you like beer, recommended shochu type. Do you want to uh, talk about that a little probably, bit? Probably, yeah, probably uh, if you're a beer or a whiskey drinker, you're probably going to gravitate toward barley shochu since that's a predominant ingredient in those drinks. Uh, I find that white wine drinkers or sake drinkers tend to uh, more, more be more interested in, in rice shochu. Uh, red wine drinkers, actually, it's, it's usually hard to think about red wine and spirits finding a partner, but uh, purple sweet potatoes or red sweet potatoes, actually, some the shochu sometimes has a little bit of a tannic quality. It's more about the esters. There's no there's no tannins in it, uh, at least not not any appreciable tannins. And then for kokuto, the easy one is rum, right, because it's made with sugar. Rum's made with sugar. And then uh, for regular old sweet potato, that's standard sweet potato shochu are actually the most challenging aroma wise and, and flavor wise. So a lot of people are put off by them the first time they try them. And so I tend to recommend that more to like mezcal or tequila drinkers. People are a little bit more adventurous, mm -hmm. you know, that like weird flavors because and they're made with sweet potatoes, but they're not made with the sweet potatoes we're used to eating. Right. right? You also Typical. have a very fun fact about tequila, about the amount, uh, three times as much shochu is made in Japan as tequila in Mexico but most is That's consumed right. in Japan. So very little That's shochu right. is exported. That was from your book, little tidbit from right. your book. I hope you don't mind me giving away your book secrets. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, it and would be then, hard, to hard to cover the shochu chapter in an hour. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then the whiskey drinkers would like barrel aged and vodka yep. drinkers vacuum distilled barley and That's then right. rum drinkers would like the black sugar variety. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Like uh yeah, the vacuum distillation is very common in shochu and it's not that common in other distilled spirits traditions. Uh gin gin makers use it sometimes. 
but the vacuum still gives you a, a much lighter, cleaner flavor. So a very common brand throughout Japan is Ichiko. Uh, it's a vacuum distilled barley shochu, and it's really easy drinking. Uh, and I, in my experience, the, the vacuum distilled shochus are actually less likely to give you a hangover uh, if, if you overindulge. So that's always of course good, you shouldn't be mixing good to think and about, all that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love I love this one too. Shochu is single distilled, therefore no residual sugars. It is low proof, therefore fewer calories. And you actually have a very interesting story about being low calorie. Do you want to talk about your shochu diet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I actually injured my knee playing soccer, uh, and that made me give up exercise for a while, and I gained some weight. And then I ended up deciding, I knew shochu was low calorie, right? It's lower proof and it doesn't have residual sugars. So it's uh, lower calorie than other drinks. And so I decided to go on a shochu diet where if I was going to drink, I would replace my other alcohol choices with shochu uh, six times out of seven. So one, one time a week, basically, I could, if I was drinking, I could drink anything I wanted, red wine, beer, all the other things I like. But any other night of that week or, you know, over a period of seven drinking sessions, I could only uh, drink shochu. And I lost uh, about 15 pounds in seven months. That's awesome. And I really didn't, didn't really change anything else about my diet. So. That's crazy. Other and you didn't, that had, you didn't had, change exercising had, or not exercising. It was really just changing your drink. That's right. Now, it did require, if I was going to go out to eat and drink, that meant I had to go to a Japanese restaurant, which generally will be healthier and this was in New York City. It would right. generally be healthier than going out for, you know, Italian or French or a burger or pizza. So. <laughs> wow, interesting. And then um, because shochu is traditional, it's very flavorful and aromatic. Um, because it's a craft spirit, it's, it has shokunin. So it has the tradition and the heritage of craftspeople, right? It, that's what you mean that's by right. shokunin, right. right? And then yeah, it's right. from... It's like, yeah. So it's also from Japan, so it pairs with food, but it's also a made in Japan product. It's not made elsewhere, which is, you know, a variety of sustainable benefits there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, there really is a focus here in Kyushu to use locally, in, local ingredients. For example, the Kagoshima uh, shochu, even though it's sweet potato, but you always, virtually always start with a rice fermentation and most of the distilleries are still using kagoshima rice even though kagoshima rice is considered some of the worst it's like one of the worst places to grow rice i won't say it's bad rice i'll say it's one of the most difficult places to grow rice because they get hit by every typhoon right any typhoon that comes to japan is hitting southern kyushu first and uh and the, the soil is actually very uh, rocky and then you have a lot of volcanoes I remember on the ep, one of the episodes that I watched of you with uh, Mr. Bradshaw down in Kagoshima with Sakurajima, right? All of that ash ends up in the soil, and rice and other grains don't really like ash in the soil. However, sweet potatoes love it. All that minerality, they just thrive. So that's actually part of why the local agriculture shifted to sweet potatoes after it was introduced from uh, Okinawa. Then that became one of the predominant crops. The trouble with sweet potatoes is as soon as you harvest them, they start to rot. They're not a storage right. vegetable or grain like like rice or barley. So you've got to do something with them. So they started making alcohol, started That's making shochu. And you were talking about um, how sweet potato was originally introduced by the Portuguese. And sweet potato actually saved people in southern Kyushu during the 1700s because there was a big crop failure, I guess, for rice, right? That's right. There was a, a grain failure. There's a, a, a famine, basically, was started by this, and tens of thousands of peasants died in, in northern Kyushu, and they were spared in southern Kyushu in what was the Satsumo domain at the time because they had sweet potatoes to survive on. That's amazing. I mean, so much of, of the culture of distilling as well, you said, maybe came from South Korea. Is that right? You know, there's, there's three theories about where the distillation technology came from. I, I espouse the Korean route simply because South, well, yeah, Korea wasn't South Korea at the time, but it's very close to Kyushu. And both, if you look at maps of the period from, from that time period, uh, the Koreans and the Japanese both had Tsushima Island on their map. So the fishermen between Japan and Korea would meet at Tsushima and trade. 
And so it, it seems very likely to me just because of proximity and that trading hub that that's where it came from. The other routes that were mentioned that are, are proposed are the coming up through Okinawa. But the Okinawans use Black Koji exclusively. And Black Koji did not arrive at the same time distillation technology did in Japan. Uh, shochu was originally made with yellow koji, which is how you make sake. So it makes more sense to me that distillation technology arrived from Korea. And then they basically started distilling sake. Because I imagine the sake being made in Kyushu wasn't very good because they didn't have climate control. And it's very hot and humid down here. Right. Yeah. And so d distillation takes care of that. It takes It takes out a lot of that the off flavors you might get from a, a hot uh, sake fermentation. That's interesting. And uh, yeah, in, this is a, a photo of the ash, volcanic ash on the fields with the sweet potato and uh, how that adds to the local flavor of the shochu. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how you can drink shochu. There's a lot of different varieties you recommend. Is there certain types of shochu which really is better to drink in a certain way? Like the ones made with rice maybe would be better warm or what What would you recommend? It's, it's a little bit more about production methods. So an, an atmospheric distilled shochu is going to have a lot bigger and richer flavors and so it doesn't really matter if it's barley, rice, sweet potato, kokuto sugar, or another ingredient, because there's about 50 different ingredients you can use to make shochu, but those are the predominant ones. Um, it's more about that those rich flavors go really, really well with hot water. So oyuwadi uh, is, is a great way to drink them. Uh, those will also hold up on the rocks quite yeah. It's like Ginjo sake in a way. Mm -hmm. And so those are those shine more chilled. And then what I like to do with those is I like to drink them uh, soda wadi, tansan wadi, because you just take, you get a really nice effervescence and, and all of those those bright aromas well, really show themselves. Let's when you drink try that. Soda. I need to try another one. Um, this is the Kagoshima one, the Chiran tea. Oh, that would be great with soda, I believe. Soda? Okay. Yeah. That's actually... A, Really interesting. Uh, Chiran in Kagoshima is famous for both sweet potato and for green tea. Mm -hmm. And this distillery has been making sweet potato shochu for years, and they were also growing tea on their property. And so what they ended up doing is they put fresh picked tea leaves from their own plants and put them into the fermentation to make that shochu. So that's the Chiran tea chu, which is, is a really, really nice drink. Okay. It has a beautiful aroma. Great smell. How much... Typically the green tea. I would do 50-50 maybe. 50-50. Well, I just did like 5 to 90. <laughs> I'm diluting. <laughs> I have to keep focus. <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, quite so they... nice. Yeah, nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, it... And I, I thought that was a good one for your show simply because they're using the green tea that they, you know, pick themselves, which is, yeah, is really nice. Yeah, I mean, nice. really interesting how you were saying actually 50 different ingredients can be used mm -hmm. for shochu. And in Hokkaido, they use shiso. So interesting. Yeah, yeah shiso is a popular uh, ingredient. Now, when you're using something like green tea or shiso, you're not getting any fermentable sugars from that. So it's, it's not what's making the alcohol. It's what's making the flavor. So you still need a base of rice or barley, typically, to, to use one of those. I call them aromatics, right? Something like shiso or green tea. But what's interesting about the chiran tichu is that they've actually put put the, the green tea into sweet potato shochu, which the sweet potato itself has a, have, sweet potato itself has a lot of flavor. So uh, it's interesting that they've done it that way rather than using something more neutral like barley or rice. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, another, of course, sustainable or artisan or craftsperson connection is how um, so it's very labor intensive, like making sake is labor intensive certain times of the year, shochu as well. Um, in the picture above, you can see the guy mixing out the oxygen. You were talking about oxygen being bad for shochu in the process and you it's quite and you've made it yourself. Can you talk a little bit about the intensity of the process? Sure. So I've, I've, I've worked in a number of different distilleries, uh, usually just for a few days, but then every year I go to Yamato Zakura and make all handmade sweet potato shochu. 
And the Toji actually refers to it as the sadistic system because he doesn't cut any corners. Wow. We typically begin, uh, depending on which style we're making, we typically are starting the day at between 5 and 6 a.m. And we uh, wash the sweet potatoes is the first job of the day. No, I'm sorry. That's the second job of the day. First job of the day is actually washing the rice. And then you need to uh, uh, moisturize the rice as well. So after you've washed it, it sits in water for a while. Then you go have breakfast. Um, and then you wash the sweet potatoes. And that's an extremely dirty job. Um, but you're basically working from 5 a.m. to six, or, um, between 5 and 6. I would say you're going nonstop until about 4 p.m. Other than maybe a 15, 20-minute lunch break. And then things slow down a little bit. And then you might do some bottle, you know do some maintenance around the distillery or something. But then there's there's uh, evening work as well. So after dinner, you have to maintain the uh, koji temperature in the koji room, and you have to stir all of the pots, all, all the ceramic. He, he makes all of his fermentations in ceramic pots that are buried in the ground. And he'll have three times eight, about 30, 32. He'll have about, about 40 pots going in at one time in the distillery and to stir couple times a day, uh, depending on the heat and humidity in the, in the environment. So it's, it's, it's quite a bit of work. And I would say on average, it's about a 14 to 16 hour day. Wow. And it's six days a week. Uh, and there's still work to do on Sunday, even though technically they're closed. Be, be, if it's, so if it's, it's seasonal, because it's connected to fresh ingredients, right? So is it for sweet potato, is it really like an autumn time that you would be making the, the shochu? That's right. So uh, typically September through December, sometimes into January is the sweet potato shochu season. So it really does follow the harvest. In fact, the toji used to follow the harvests. So uh, they would move around the country and uh, barley is typically harvested in May, rice in autumn, sweet potatoes in late so, autumn, winter. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the uh, and then kokuto is actually usually harvested in spring, so they would actually move around and make the different styles of shochu in different regions based on what ingredients they were using. That's really interesting. Um, I love that you're also wearing the mai mai kake, the traditional <laughs> aprons, right? And that's that's okay. a whole nother sustainable industry because you're perpetuating the traditional style of marketing that actually used to be the marketing style for the brand, right? I, I love the story mm -hmm. of Maikake. Is that the name yeah. name of the uh, manufacturer that you were working with? That's one of your That's main right. photos. Yeah, Yamato Zakura is the distillery. And uh, one of their brands, actually, that they've made a label that looks like a Maikake. So it even has the band that goes around the bottle. It's a clear bottle uh -huh. and with the, that navy and white Maikake. Uh, that, that brand is called uh, Hikari, Yamato Zakura Hikari, and it's made with fresh local rice. Uh, it, and that's actually the hardest one to make uh, all season because the fresh rice is much harder to get properly steamed and cooled and, and inoculated with koji. And so that takes, uh, the, those are the, the longest days of the, of the brewing distilling season or, or when he's making that brand. Wow. It's... It's cool. You can use it for cooking. You don't have to be making shochu to enjoy using a maikake, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, one, one thing we didn't introduce yet is your uh, website, Kampai. Do you want to talk a little bit about the website and what kind of information you have there? Sure. So I started uh, basically a shochu tasting notes blog around 2011. Uh, a few years after I discovered shochu, and I was frustrated because I couldn't find any good language and information, uh, in, good information in English about uh, about shochu. It, everything I found was like bad, like Google translations of of producers' websites, and it just wasn't helpful. And so I just started to write about it, and the shochu makers would come to New York so City on sales calls, and I would uh, go and ask them questions, and I'd write about it, and. Then I started visiting distilleries, and so it really, it's I introduce different brands and give them my give my tasting notes and recommended drinking styles and that sort of thing. But then I also tell stories about the industry, and the, the site really went on hiatus for I guess it was almost two complete years because I, I was trying to get it updated. I'm, I've never built a website, so I don't know anything about that sort of thing, and it just took a long time to get the site rebuilt so that it could be mobile friendly. 
and finally we've relaunched and finally I have additional writers to help me uh, because it's just, it's a lot of work to do by yourself. And so Chris Pellegrini just wrote his first article. Uh, there's a, a friend of ours named Maya who lives down in Kagoshima, who's going to write uh, for the site. And I have a few friends back in New York who are going to try to continue to write about the brands that are available in New York, in the U.S. That's great. And you guys are doing regular like um, podcasting or regular live shows, aren't you? No? Yeah, so we, we just started <laughs> a couple weeks ago. We started at Instagram Live, mm -hmm. which we're doing it every Tuesday night in New York time, which is Wednesday morning Japan time. Uh, I used to have a, a – I was a, vi a guest bartender in New York for a long time with what I called Show Tuesday. And so it was every Tuesday night or a couple Tuesday nights a, a month, and I would go to different izakaya or bars, and I would introduce the customers to Shochu. We'd have drink discounts and things like that. Uh, and so we decided to call it Shochu Pros Show Tuesday. And so Christopher and I basically talk about something about Shochu every week. Uh, starts at, I guess, 10 a.m. Japan time. Uh, 9 p.m. on Tuesday, New York time, 10, 10 a.m. Japan time on Wednesdays. And then we, we actually have started uh, recording a podcast, but we ha haven't yet released it. We're, we're getting some content recorded and edited before we start to, to release those episodes, but those should be coming soon. Nice. Um, you want to talk a little bit about history? I love in the book how you introduce Saigo Takamori as a shochu fan. Uh, you want to introduce who he is? Sure. Yeah, I, I actually was a history major in college, and so writing the book helped, had, gave me a chance to geek out about history because I never actually worked professionally as a historian. But Saigo Takamori, I like to call him the real last samurai because he was a Satsuma domain samurai who at one point was actually um, banished to Amami, which was... Uh, his punishment for something he had done against the Shimazu clan. And, but then he was eventually welcomed back, and then he ended up leading the, uh, the overthrow of the shogun. And he, he led the army that uh, took uh, Osaka Castle. And, it, so really, and then he ended up working with the Meiji government to modernize the military. And he was doing this as a patriot, but the trouble that I think his unintended consequence is that he ended up destroying the samurai class in doing this by coming up with a modern army with, you know, with cannons and, and rifles and all that sort of thing. There was no, no longer need for samurai. So he put himself out of a job. So he went back to Kagoshima, which I think was still Satsuma at that time, and, and started a, a military academy. And then his, his students had an uprising against the government. And so the, the, the army that he helped to build came down and uh, ended the uprising. And it was actually uh, Shiroyama is the mountain in central Kagoshima city where he had his last stand. And apparently he was killed during the battle, but his head was removed and has never been found. Oh. And they believe that his, some of the surviving students from his rebellion had had stolen his head and taken it away so that the government couldn't have it. And, um, but it, what's interesting is he wasn't actually, he, w he didn't want to rebel, but he felt a responsibility to rebel because it was his students who had started the rebellion. So in defense of his students, because he felt like he had been a bad teacher, he decided to die with them. So really he, was, he was very loyal. Loyalty. Yeah, loyal to his students. Yes. That's really interesting. Another uh, little tidbit from your book concerning sustainability is about bottling. You were talking about traditionally shochu was sold out of the maker's shop. Families would bring their empty ceramic storage vessels to the shop for refilling. Let's bring that back. I love refilling. I, know, I right? love reuse. That's awesome. And there's some it would be beautiful. Like a growler, right? Yeah, and there's some beautiful ceramic containers. Let me see if I can find one. Um, there's uh, s some great ones. What brands are still using ceramic? This one's from Yufui, I believe. Okay. Yeah, you, typically. Yufutake. Uh, I found it online. Sure what, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Mostly, mostly it's Awamori distilleries who are doing this uh, because in Okinawa, they have a tradition of aging in ceramic. Mm -hmm. And they have something that they call the Shitsugi system, which is similar to the sherry solera system, which is used in Spain for sherry aging. That's, used, that's done using uh, wood barrels, but 
in Okinawa, uh, Shitsugu actually predates Solera, and it's in these ceramic pots, and, and they'll be lined up in the distillery or in the – now they'll, they'll still do this in liquor stores in Okinawa, where at the front of the shop is the oldest – the pot with the oldest liquid in it, and then the second oldest will be behind that and on down the road to your newest pot. And so you will serve – as you fill people's containers, you will do that from the oldest pot all day long. And at the end of the day, as you're closing up shop, you'll move liquid from the second oldest pot into the oldest and on down the line. And then you'll refill the newest pot with the, with new make, right, with new, newly made awamori. And so what that means is that in that oldest pot, there's a little bit of liquid from the oldest point at which you put any liquid in that pot because of the mixing that's happened, right? And, and the awamori gets this really, really deep, almost caramel flavor. And it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. Mm. Um, and there's so not quite like that a, tradition with shochu. Yeah, you're adding, not only is it more sustainable, but you're adding an interesting flavor mix, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we had an yeah. interesting and, uh, comment from Chris on Periscope, says, shochu growlers need to become a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love I that. They really should. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, you were so, talking about the containers. Do you want to continue? Yeah, so I think... Mm. Um, Sure, sure. And so that the ceramic pots aren't used so much in shochu anymore because you don't have that shitsugi tradition, although you can still find ceramics for it. One one brand that I do like is, uh, what, what what is it called? This is embarrassing. Um, from I know it's from Kyoya Distillery, and they make a uh, Kame Shizuku, and it comes in a, in a ceramic vessel that you can actually use to store grains Oh. Uh, or, or, or used for pickling afterward. Oh, it's a very, great. very elegant looking pot. And so those are nice to give as gifts to people because then they can reuse the container. It's not like giving a bottle to somebody that they then have to recycle. Yeah. Right. No, no, that's um, great. I, I yeah, often, I, when we lived in Kyushu, I would often see um, shochu in bars. All the izakaya had a range of shochu in the ceramic containers. And they're all unique and beautiful with the kanji written on it. I, I hope that comes back. Well, you still see that in bars. And what they'll do often is it's called mai wadi. And this is where you mix shochu with water uh, several days. And there's actually a chemical process that changes the flavor and aroma of the spirit that would be different than if you just served at mizu wadi with what's happening at the time of service. Right. So that you still find that. Yeah. Great. Uh, Melanie wrote, learning loads. Great conversation. Thank you, Melanie. I, I think it's time for me to take another sip, but I want to keep focus. I need to keep my conversation going. Uh, do you want to just talk about this one from Fukuoka that you sent? And I'll sample it later. The Shige Masu? From Shige Masu. Ah, Shige Masu. Okay, yeah, so this is actually an interesting... Yeah, this is an interesting topic. I'll just smell uh, this it. Is, uh, sake leaves shochu. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's gonna, it's gonna smell like uh, ginjo sake. It's it's made with ginjo sake leaves, and so this is this is part of the no waste philosophy, right? Mutai nai, in which um, sake leaves have residual alcohol in them. So sake leaves are made when you press the sake, right? You're you're removing the solids uh, from the liquid, and then you're bottling the liquid, and that's what you're selling. And those leftover sol solids still have uses. And so, but the problem is that they still have alcohol in them. So if you tried to use them as fertilizer without removing that alcohol, uh, you would damage the roots of the plants. It'd be toxic to, to agriculture. But once you remove the alcohol, it can safely be used as food fertilizer. And it's really nutrient rich because it's rice, right? So what ends up, what they realize is that they could distill the leftover sake leaves. And then they would make kasutori shochu is what it's called. And so that's a kasutori shochu. And this was actually ubiquitous across Japan. Sake breweries all across the country would distill their lees, and then, then they could uh, use the, the remaining lees, which now had no alcohol for, as fertilizer. But the, and then they would sell the, the kasutori shochu to the local people in their town because sake was typically an expensive product. So that would often be sent off to the big cities for sale. And so the local people would be drinking kasutori shochu uh, which was made from the leaves of the sake that was being consumed in Edo or in Osaka or Kyoto. You've got this great graphic from one of your talks where you're, you're showing the whole circular economy of using uh, planting rice, fertilizing rice, harvesting rice, making sake, distill the leaves, and then, of course, using the leaves in 
shochu or planting rice or agriculture again. So it's it's a closed loop, and there's yep. there's so little waste. And you you often refer to the idea or the concept of motai nai, which is so important mm -hmm. in Japan, and and shochu is a great example of that. That's right. Yeah, that's I'm really drawn to the kasutori shochu for this reason. I think it's a really special style. That's great. Um, I will smell the next one. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Toyama Distillery Kumamoto? Toyo... Uh, yeah, so to Toyonaga. Unfortunately, okay. my handwriting is terrible. No, that's all right. But yeah, Toyonaga is a distillery in the Kuma uh, River Basin. And it's... Th so that is a WTO geographic indi indication for Kuma Shochu which is the rice shochu from that region. And Toyonaga is committed to, to uh, local agriculture. He makes everything from locally grown organic rice. And we'll, so, we will uh, put all the links below the video so people can find these wonderful uh, brands. And it says organic rice on it? That's right. It's organic rice. And then that one is atmospheric distilled. Now the sake leaves shochu, the shige masu from Fukuoka, is, is a vacuum distilled rice shochu. And you can see how different the aromas are if you if you compare the two of those, simply based on the distillation technique. Now the the shige masu uses ginjo yeast, and yeast changes aromas as well. But uh, I think maybe when once you taste them side by side, you'll see just how different vacuum versus atmospheric distillation is. Okay, uh, maybe after this comment, uh, Maya Ali, thank you for your comment on YouTube. She says there are quite a few izakaya in Kagoshima with temporary licenses now to be able to sell takeout shochu charged by volume so customers can bring their own bottle and fill it up. That's great. You know about that? Definitely should promote yep. that. That's right. They've been doing that uh, down there in Kagoshima, especially where there's such a rich shochu culture. It really is the, the shochu kingdom is the fairest thing to call Kagoshima Prefecture. They have over 100 active distilleries, uh, which is the most uh, per capita of any, any region of the world. It's, it's remarkable. And there is one type of shochu you warned your audience they might not want to try with a fish in it. Do you want to <laughs> talk about how that one's drunk? Yeah, well, there was this wonderful izakaya. It was a tofu-focused izakaya down in Kagoshima. Sadly, it's closed because the owner passed away. But what his his signature style, he only served one shochu. And he would have my wadi, so mixed with water beforehand, and then they would heat it up for you. And they'd put that in front of you. And if you ordered it this way, they would actually grill a dried flying fish. And they would you'd stick it in your glass and... As the because it was dried already and then it was grilled, it was very hard. So the shochu would soften it up, and then that would become your your drinking snack. But you would just keep it back in your glass whenever, you know, you weren't eating it. So you end up with all these little fish bits floating oh. in your shochu as you're drinking and eating. It's it's really fun, but it's it's definitely an acquired taste. Yes, I can imagine. It's like the soft serve ice cream with little fish shirashi on it. I'm not sure it's for everybody, but if you're a game, you got to try it. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. uh, okay, so I don't want to miss this one. This one has a really special story. That's right. So that is uh, Tengu Zakura from Ichiki Kushikino, which is actually the same town as Yamato Zakura. And those one cups you can only buy in two locations in Japan. It's one cup shochu. You can only buy them at the convenience store owned by the distillery and in our shop in Fukuoka, which is uh, New York Wine Traders. And this is a sweet potato shochu, satsuma shochu from Kagoshima, uh, and made. And this distillery uh, has just purchased uh, farmland in order to grow their own sweet potatoes. They want more control over the production process and the quality of the ingredients. Uh, so they've committed to now growing their own, which is an increasing thing happening among uh, sweet potato shochu distilleries. So they have more control over whether it's organic or how they want to grow it and what kind and everything. That's great. It's much better to have right. control over the whole process for sure. Um, low calorie, we talked about your shochu diet. You have an interesting graph, which I thought was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so you charted, because yep. you're a scientist, you charted your That's experience, right? right? 
And I did. Yeah. I, you can see where Christmas and New Year were because I, I climbed a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then, it, then I went back down. <laughs> so this is also on your website if people want to see your shochu diet data. I thought that was really fun. Yeah. Um, harvesting. So all the sweet potatoes and you're talking about how hard work it is. The sweet potatoes are so strangely shaped. So you said you have to take off all the, the rotten bits or, you know, it's really hard to clean. So that must be a very time yes. consuming part of it. It is. And you know, how much you, how well you clean them has a lot to do with what the shochu will taste like. There are some distilleries that they basically get the dirt off of them, but they don't really work that hard at it. So those are a little bit earthy. <laughs> um, I was surprised you, you said it starts, and, it starts rotting from the moment you take it out the ground. I didn't realize that. I mean, I mean, essentially, they're just not very shelf stable. You know, right. I think the varieties you get in supermarkets are, are more stable. But these these potatoes that are, are cultivated for sweet potato shochu are designed for high starch yield and specific flavor uh, components. And so you don't really care about how long it's going to last. So by the time it gets to the distillery, it's probably been out of the ground for 24 to 48 hours. And you will find potatoes that have begun rotting. And so part of the cleaning process is looking for those and getting rid of them so that they don't end up corrupting the fermentation. And then you want to cut off the ends of the potatoes because those are bitter. You don't want a bitter shochu. So you remove those so that you can re retain the sweetness. Right. Um, another part of the book, this is all like highlights from your book now. Uh, another part of your book is uh, uh, listing shochu bars and places not only in Japan, but in uh, New York and other places where people might be able to access good shochu. Um, I thought that was a really great section of your book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and there's a, there is also uh, liquor stores listed, uh, which is probably more relevant in the current environment since a lot of bars and restaurants are are closed. Uh, and then I think I also included some online resources where people can find them. A great thing about shochu living in Japan is that you can just order it online or you can even buy it at auction. You can and buy it at auction? Old, yeah, like Yahoo Auctions has shochu. What? So you can, you can find like rare old shochu. This is a hobby of Christopher's. I haven't gotten into it yet. I'm, I'm scared about how much I might spend <laughs> on rare bottles of shochu if I do that. But he's found some pretty amazing things. Uh, so on, in, on in the sites. book, you were talking about how Okinawan alcohol is kept for up to 400 years or something. But um, any kind of shochu is also kept longer sometimes, is becoming more popular. Typically, typically not. Aged shochu is not really part of the, uh, the culture. Mm -hmm. There is there is the style the idea of koshu of, of a shochu which would be three years or older, but they're not particularly po popular. They're a pretty small percentage of the market, and they also cost a lot. Because and I think you know for... shochu is extremely affordable. Right. So that's one of the other, other nice things about it here in Japan. Yeah. Uh, Whereas sake so is can spend... supposed nihonshu is supposed to be drunk quickly, right? Not kept. That's right. Yeah. So there is the... aged nihonshu as well, but it's again not a very common style. Yeah, um, but in Okinawa, they, they do a lot of aging. Yeah, it looked like some of the earthen pots were covered in dust and cobwebs, and they're very exciting <laughs> to dig it out and have a have a taste. I, I love the uh, strong zero information in the book. Of course, I was living in Kyushu for a while, so I drank a lot of Chuhai. And uh, in Kyushu, you're having real nice shochu Chuhai because it's from the izakaya. But a lot of people know yeah. Chuhai and Shochu around the country from Chuhai's in the convenience store, right? Um, do you want to introduce That's that right. that strong zero, uh, how it's different? Yeah, so uh, Chuhai is typically, the canned Chuhai's are made with what's called Korui Shochu, <laughs> which is not sustainable at all. Okay, Korui Shochu starts life as raw distillate from South America or Southeast Asia is then shipped in bulk to Japan where it's finished. And, and then uh, it's basically the cheapest alcohol you can buy in Japan. You can get about five liters of Korui Shochu for, I think, about 1,500 yen or maybe 2,000 yen. It's just not healthy. It's, just, yeah. it's essentially ethanol 
it's diluted back to a survivable alcohol yeah. percentage. So think, when we're talking about shochu, we're really talking about honkaku or authentic shochu. Yeah, I think Chris has a great comment now. He says, hangover in a can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they can be lethal. Some people drink them, some people love them. Yeah, so when people think of shochu and chuhai, they think it's the same, but unless you're getting it from an izakaya that's making shochu with fruit juice, it's not. Not at all the same, right? But e even most izakaya will be using korui shochu when they're making a chuhai. But some will use premium shochu. They'll use honkaku or authentic shochu. Usually they'll be a vacuum distilled rice or barley shochu, something like ichiko or hakutake shiro, um, which is still relatively affordable so you, um, and, and pretty light. So as I was saying earlier, those vacuum distilled shochu tend to go really well in a highball right, with, with soda. And so you could mix it with fruit juice and soda if you wanted to, and then you then you have a chuha. And I've I've lived in Japan for a very long time. Um, I did not realize that chuhai stands for what was it? Shochu, shochu and highball. Highball. Yep, that's right. Shochu highball. So I, I learned so much from your book. It's so useful. <laughs> Great. And then oh, um, well, I think same for sake. We often think of the toji the person making the head maker brewer as being a man but in your book you talk about uh, some famous women toji do you want to introduce that's right yeah so probably the most legendary is jufuku san uh down in in kumamoto from jufuku distillery and she was one of the first female toji of the modern era. And she's just a legend. She's in her 70s now, but she still helps out making handmade rice shochu every, every year. And then there's uh, Sadaina Nishihira, who's making kokuto shochu in Amami. And she's, uh, I think in her early 30s, she's also a musician and a, graph, uh, a visual artist, making really beautiful shochu and also very creative in other ways. Uh, so I think she's a important part of the future for shochu. Nice. But I'm, I'm really glad to see these women, uh, you know, entering into this pretty male dominated industry. Yeah, I think. And uh, as you mentioned in the book and elsewhere, um, most of the distilleries are very family run, very small. Uh, some of the ones you mentioned were two people and others 20. Mm -hmm. 20 would be a large distillery. Really interesting. That's right. You have a whole section on gift shops, shochu, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> Do you want to talk about it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's about 50 different ingredients that you can make shochu from. And I think what was happening during the, the shochu boom, which is really, the, you had one shochu boom in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, when uh, Ichiko became popular and made shochu a national drink. And then you had a second boom in the early 2000s when sweet potato shochu took off. But during this time, uh, the government and the shochu industry were trying to make shochu more popular. So they started allowing different ingredients to be used. And so I, I think a lot of local governments started to apply for, oh, we want to make shochu out of this product. We want to make shochu out of that product because it's whatever their local ag agricultural product was. But these weren't actually regions necessarily that made shochu traditionally. They just wanted to have a shochu made with their local ingredient. But so all of these different ingredients end up getting approved. So you have some really strange ones. There's cactus shochu. You can have kombu shochu. You can have, as I mentioned before, a green tea or shiso. There's also milk shochu. <laughs> like, so. What does that taste like? It's just, and I think. Is it like yogurt? It, it's a little lactic, said? like like yogurt. Yeah. It has a yogurt finish. It's still clean. It's still clean and clear because it's distilled alcohol, but it has a little bit of a lactic finish to it. I like it. Um, Is that like a, a calpis too high, maybe? It could be. That would probably go great in one of those. <laughs> yeah. So I call these gift shop shochus because these aren't these aren't predominant styles. These are really just sort of niche, the kinds of things you'd find in the local train station for the local agricultural ingredient, but not really something that you're going to find on liquor store shelves or in izakaya around the country. Yeah, I thought that was that was really interesting. And then uh, the different ways, we talked a little bit about keeping it in ceramic containers. Um, how long is the process, did you say, two weeks in total? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, to, make, to make the shochu fermentation mm -hmm. takes about two and a half to three weeks. 
but then after you distill, which is you've got you've you've uh, evaporated the alcohol and recondensed it out into a liquid again, liquid again, uh, then you're you're going to age it. Typically, most shochu is aged probably three to six months in inert enamel lined stainless tanks. Basically, they're not going to impart any flavor or aroma. They're just going to let the, the the spirit settle down and and that the flavor gets softer with with a little bit of time. But then if you age in ceramic, that allows for some oxidization because these are unglazed pots. And so you end up um, getting a little bit of minerality from the clay, but you also get some oxidization from exposure to air. And that ends up getting more rich, deep tastes and rounder tastes, uh, much like you get in awamori in Okinawa. And then there's also barrel aging, which has become more popular as whiskeys become more popular. And so barrel aged shochu obviously are going to turn golden, just like whiskeys do. Uh, it, but then they'll also have some of those uh, some of those flavors or aromas you you think of with whiskeys or aged rums. Sometimes a little bit of vanilla, maybe a little bit of mint or something like that. So you end up getting some other flavors out of the barrel, out of the wood. And those will be aged for one year to three years typically. And then it, when you get shochu in a bottle, it's usually in a bottle now, um, you should keep it in paper or in a dark place. Is that right? Uh that's been traditionally recommended. I think as long as you're keeping it out of direct sunlight, most of the bottles are now uh, dark glass, either brown or black glass. And that's really not going to be affected unless you like, leave it out in the sun. Uh, with a clear bottle, you should probably be a little bit more careful. Careful, um, But I think the filtering and everything that goes into the processing of shochu now it probably isn't as much as a, of a concern as it used to be. Okay. Because when I took the photos outside and then I read that, and I was like, oh, dear, <laughs> yep. I'm not being a very good example, am I? Um, no, no, there no. was a really interesting story. Um, you were talking about working at a shochu distillery and hearing like an earthquake. And it was mm. because of one of the, the wooden barrels that was holding all the shochu or part of the process. Do you want to tell that story? It was, was actually a wooden still. Okay. Uh, a few distilleries are still using wooden stills, which are uh, made of cedar. And even though the, the fermentation is only in the still for a few hours, it end up, you end up getting a little bit of cedar note in the taste of the of the shochu. But in this this distillery, it's the Manzen Distillery in, in Kagoshima. Uh, I was helping, and they start their day at like 4 a.m. And it's it's just frenetic. There's just there's like five or six distillery staff, and everybody's running around and doing everything. And then uh, Suddenly, the building starts to rattle a little bit. And there's this loud thumping sound. I'm not sure what was going on. And I thought it was an earthquake. Like, I, I, this is before I moved to Japan. And I don't know if I'd ever been in an earthquake. And I didn't know what was going on. But nobody seemed bothered by it. And then I, one of the staff saw that I looked concerned. And he just pointed at the still. There, as it was heating up, because it was so old, it was just shaking the whole building. And then once it got up to temperature, the whole place calmed down again. But it was just... It was a wild experience. That is wild. But when I heard that story, it reminded me that um, there are far-reaching effects of using traditional methods. Like you talked about, um, there's only one person who knows how to repair that kind of still if it needed repairing. Um, all of these clay pots, there's people that are making those in the traditional way. So there is a real far-reaching effect of the whole traditional heritage of shochu, which is much more than just that product itself. And I thought that was a really nice story as a way to connect a wider you know, loop around for sustainability right. in shochu. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, and it's all the, all the local agricultural support. It's, it's really, um, you know, there's, there's an industry around the industry, which is, is really nice. And it, it employs a lot of people in rural, rural Japan. Definitely. So, um, well, that, that is our hour. Right. Thank you so much great. for well, all of you your great insights. Of and I would highly recommend to anybody interested in our talk today, um, get this book, Japanese Drinks. You can get it from Amazon Japan hardback, and it's also on Kindle, I believe. And uh, yeah, wealth of information on your website, on YouTube, on your lectures. Um, so if anybody is interested, please reach out on Twitter, Instagram, um, Facebook as well, you've got. So thank That's you right. so much, Stephen. It's been great talking to you. 
Thank you everybody for joining and for all your great Thank questions. You. Have a nice weekend. I'm going to go you. try Come the by. rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> Bye everybody. Thank you.